Hi friends, so I wanted to give you a little rundown my own personal thoughts about the Australian federal election that took place last night and, and where the Scott Morrison government, uh, who was already in, was returned, uh, unfortunately. Um, the Scott Morrison government is a conservative, racist, xenophobic, Islamophobic, minority crushing, minority group crushing, um, corporate serving party. And, uh, now he sees, we'll see this as a mandate to go ahead and continue on serving, serving corporations and crushing the rest of us and throwing us crumbs. Um, and this seems to be happening all around the world where um, there's two parties usually in various countries, like this happens in the United States, where um, there's a party, uh, there's two parties, and uh, one is uh, what the Juice Media here calls, the Juice Media is a satirical group, which is probably the only independent news left is a satire group, but the Juice Media calls the two parties here shit pa- um, the shit party and the shit light party. I would have to agree with that. Anyway, I want to uh, actually quick, quickly run down a very brief history of the Labour Party and why it actually has turned out to be a party that can't seem to challenge uh, this party. You know, this is almost like it's unbelievable they couldn't win this election um, against this party. And, of course, we have a preferential system here in Australia, preferential voting, or what some um, people in America would call ranked choice voting. So we actually have more than two parties to choose from, and that's a healthy democracy. But I don't know if actually a lot of Australians actually um, uh, utilise this this um, pre- preferential voting. And, of course, you don't really hear any of these parties, the major parties, ever mentioning preferential voting because they don't want people to do that. The CIA helped overthrow Gough Whitlam in, 19, in 1975. They even admitted it. Um, and so the Gough Whitlam's government was dismissed, and Gough Whitlam was for free health care, free public education. Um, they were for indigenous rights. They were, um, as far as I can tell, he was against war, and he didn't want to play ball. He didn't want to submit to the U.S. empire, and that's why, as usual, the CIA, that um, democracy-loving country, the U.S., um, helped overthrow Gough Whitlam because you can't have any sort of country that isn't submitting to U.S. empire. And I call U.S. an empire because it has 800 bases worldwide, plus, plus. So anyway, um, so Gough Whitlam was overthrown with the help of the CIA in 1975, and um, it's been a neoliberal mess ever since. Um, Prime Minister Hawke, Bob Hawke, who was elected in 83, he uh, wasn't really much better, and he actually helped... Dere- he and Paul Keating, both Labor Prime Ministers, both helped deregulate... Uh, various things. They helped, uh, Paul Keating helped consolidate the Murdoch Press, uh, which is um, partly why we have this government today, in, in great part in many ways. Uh, that's Rupert Murdoch I'm talking about. Um, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating also helped destroy the unions. These are Labor Prime Ministers. Uh, there's, a, there's a list of things that they did that were very problematic. So they were neoliberal Prime Ministers. And as I said, it's been a neoliberal mess ever since. So that's um, sort of what, and and of course now the uh, the current the Labor Party that was led by Bill Shorten <coughs> and the other prime ministers Rudd and Gillard and those people like that, they have sort of been moved to the centre and have been sort of ignoring the criticisms about that party. They had a massive. Uh, a bunch of people that were supporters left the Labor Party for a while and then they decided they better give some power to the um, various uh, local groups so they have some say in things, but really that's not really working very well. And they're still ignoring the fact that they're not being what Labor should be and that is pushing for social equality, um, strengthening unions uh, so that workers have more rights. <clears throat> they're not... Uh, addressing New Start, which is a unemployment uh, benefit, which um, is is absolutely ridiculously p- low, and so people who are on it can't survive. They can't pay their rents, and a lot of them end up homeless. And they refuse to even, at, before this election, even commit to a certain level of increase for New Start. That's the kind of party that the Labor Party has become. It's just basically been trying to become like a shit light, as, as the um, juice media calls them. They're not, they're, not, they're, they're not bold like the 
cons- neoconservatives the, who just basically are very obviously, well, they pretend they're going to do one thing and do something else, of course, but they, they, um, mouth, they have no policies, like the Scott Morrison government had no policies, but and spent all their time attacking these labor policies, which were better than they had been, meaning they were actually, uh, there was, you know, some talk of, health care and there was different things like that but they were all sort of i don't know wishy-washy and that's the problem and they left it too late to actually really be talking um about it and there was it was it wasn't really also they had a leader bill shorten who nobody seemed to like and they wouldn't let go of him um and so that sort of the scott morrison was the preferred prime minister even though he's awful so that tells you something about how little people like bill shorten this is the one that was running for the Labor Party in this election. Uh, so they had some sort of wishy-washy policies that were kind of, uh, kind of Labor things, but they weren't really strong. And the Scott Morrison government, the uh, coalition government, they actually just attacked those policies and they had the full backing of the Murdoch press, which owns most of the press in Australia. So there was a big fear campaign against, um, the Labor Party during this election. I'm not blaming the Murdoch press entirely for it or the fact that the Scott Morrison, who had no policies, but just spent his time attacking the Labor policies. I'm not saying they're all to blame. I think the Labor Party, the Australian Labor Party, has has had a history of just moving to the centre, and I'm worried that because of this loss that they're going to see that this is some sort of um, some sort of an excuse to move to the right. And not to, and not do any, not do anything that is supposed to be a Labor thing to do. I don't know, but um, that's what could happen. Uh, I don't think that, I really don't know if they're going to learn any lessons from this. Instead of just listening to the criticisms that they've got to stop being neoliberals and start being a, the Labour Party, they just seem to go on ignoring that. And the other thing that happened, of course, is in Queensland, uh, which was the one that had the biggest swing towards the um, neoconservative Scott Morrison government, what happened there, it seems, is that the United Party um, sent a lot of preferences to them, and the United Party is a xenophobic corporate-serving party run by Clive Palmer, who's a, um, very, very wealthy, and who, uh, you know, basically, um, he's he's a do- dodgy guy, and so uh, and the and the and the One Nation, who which is a racist party, um, so they sent their preferences, I think, to the coalition government and uh but that's not really that so much the problem as was the adani coal mine which is going to be one of the largest coal mines in the world and that is sort of inland from Mackay in queensland and un- unfortunately a lot of people in queensland seem to think that they're going to benefit in some way from this coal mine as if the, the trickle down effect actually is real which it isn't it's been proven time and time again that the profits go up to the um corporate the corporations and very little goes down to people who are actually working for them or f- to the community. And what's worse is that it's going to, tr- it's going to, it's actually a backward step as far as the climate crisis. So you've heard the saying, no jobs on a dead planet. So all those people who voted for the, um, voted for the coalition because of the Sudani coal mine, um, I hope you enjoy it when we have no food because the climate will be so unpredictable that f- um, food won't grow and it's already happening. So when you're sitting there and you've got nothing to eat, you can say, well, we had the, our coal mining jobs and, and our community was benefiting in some ways from the coal mine, um, but but now we have nothing to eat. So no jobs on a dead planet, that's what I say to that, and I think that's very unfortunate that people were, were prepared to go with an outdated form of energy, coal, which is it's also producing, it'll be producing dirty coal with a lot of ash, and... Um, they're going to pay for it greatly. We're all going to pay for it. The whole planet is going to pay for that. And in a country like Australia, which has abounds in solar and um, and wind, we could have had, if we'd had any sort of forward-thinking governments, either Labor or Coalition, we would have already had a, a booming industry of alternative energy. Uh, and China, this is one of the reasons, I'll just digress, digress quickly, that China is actually pursuing very, very um, aggressively a, an alternative um, energy industry because they see that oil is, co- you know, they see that um, they're in a, a vulnerable position if they keep relying on oil and fossil fuels um, because the U.S. empire is pursuing any country that has, has oil 
um, pursuing them as in wanting to overthrow them, like Venezuela, who, that has the largest uh, reser- reserves of oil. They did that to Iraq. Look at what, what they did to Iraq. It's totally destroyed in many ways. Um, they're looking at Iran because Iran has the fourth largest oil uh, reserves on the planet, and they going to want to overthrow Iran again uh, and uh, destroy that country and have a managed chaos situation in Iran. Uh, that's what that what that's what these fossil fuels are bringing us: uh, terrible pollution and uh, war. And so, and it also is making any country that is reliant on fossil fuels. It's making us all vulnerable. So, uh, so that's why China is is a big threat to the U.S. because the U.S. recognizes China as actually um, is 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 over over uh, taking them as a great economic power, and also that they're pursuing. Um, alternative energy, which is threatening their um, oil, is threatening the oil barons. You know the, the corporations that produce oil. There's a um, number of them, and um, you know that it's it's threatening that whole industry. And so that's one of the reasons they want to crush China and possibly even go to war with China. Anybody who's an economic threat to the U.S. is basically um, somebody that they'll call. They start to demonize and then want to um, invade and overthrow, etc. Or, or destroy. So anyway, that's what China is doing, and that's what we could have been doing. We could have been pursuing these alternative energies, and have ma- have actually been standing in a really great position at this point. But we've not had any anybody with any vision as leaders in this country for a long, long time since Gough Whitlam, really, um, in '75. And uh, so that's sort of one of the reasons, and also one of the reasons that people are so desperate in this country, in Australia is because there's a lot of personal debt, uh, you know, which is really um, the personal debt is actually quite crushing for people. And so when people get desperate and, uh, you know, they're financially stressed like that, they start making really poor decisions. So that's another contributing factor to why probably some Queenslanders voted for the coalition government, thinking that this is going to help them financially in some way. Um, but I blame Labor in great part for this situation of debt because if they hadn't been continuing on these neoliberal policies, we might have a bit of social equality here and um, far less homelessness. homelessness. Um, and uh, we, we would have had still had free health care. I mean, I have to have private health insurance because in the 90s I had to, I was on a waiting list for something that I needed to have at, um, attended. And it went on and on and on. And eventually I realized that um, it's just not us, our public um, public uh, health system has been so debilitated by neoliberalism, and that's the intention, so that you can privatize things. It's been so debilitated, and the Labor Party has helped with that um, by not being strong about free health care, um, that I had to go and get private health insurance, and so I've had that for um, 20 years. Now, I can still get uh, free health care in some some ways, but the, the waiting lists for different things are really scary, and I don't want to ever have to go through that sort of scare again where I couldn't... Um, that's Alia in the background there who's jumping around. She loves playing in the dirt. And uh, she has a little bird be safe collar on, and no, we don't like to dress up our cats. Uh, I just think I, I just always say that just to let you know. Anyway, so, so that's sort of the... Um, that's the situation of, you know, the, the growing social inequality in this country is because there has been no real alternative to the neoconservatives because they're all trying to be popular. They think that they're doing the right thing by moving further to the centre, but what they're doing is they're a poor version of the neoconservatives. That's what they're being. And um, and, the, and the, the Australian Green Party is not much better. They've been trying to move to the centre because they want to. There are people in there that want to get into power, and so they they don't they don't have any vision. They don't really. They're always reacting to things. They don't show any vision. There is no vision for this country, really. And I have to say that this outcome. I I, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack last night when I. I'm going to say some more about this, but I just want to share my personal feelings about what I feel about this. It's been hard enough having these two parties trotting along and, and things have been getting worse and worse in Australia. Um, and it's been particularly bad, this uh, Scott Morrison government, because they're outwardly Islamophobic, homophobic, transphobic. Um, I have friends who are Muslim and I feel so awful for them that this is, they just, it just must be awful. It's bad enough when you're a white person. If you're an indigenous person, it's, it's awful. Uh, if you're a Muslim, it's awful. Um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just dreadful. Um, and, uh, 
if you're unemployed and there's institutionalized unemployment here um and and so you know they they've they've been given this sort of amount of money that's just disgusting and un- unlivable so you know i've found particularly in these last uh, few years just this is the australia has become unrecognizable to me i'm not saying that in the 80s or anything or sorry the late 70s it was fabulous but i know that when i was um in my 20s it was um sort of sort of more doable you know there was more there was less inequality i'm not talking i'm now i'm not talking about indigenous people that's always been a big problem the uh, sort of lack of the lack of um addressing issues in relation to indigenous people and the mortality rates and all of that um but i'm saying just in a general sense it was less uh, there was less inequality and people there was free healthcare and you could go to you could go to a university for free and all that kind of thing so you know it was it was better i have to say it was better and i'm not doing that all oh, in the old days it was much better no it actually was uh so anyway um but now it's just sort of like it's heading towards what it's like in the united states and that's just a nightmare i don't know how people survive most people how they survive in the united states it's just crushing and just so unjust and the poverty levels and the homelessness and the uh the um sacrifice zones and all of that it's just dreadful and that's where we're heading and these silly people those who voted for the coalition in queensland don't realize that they're actually inevitably in vo- voting against their interests because neo conservatives and neo liberals but neo conservatives like that they do not care about the public they do not care about you or me what they care about is lining their pockets what they care about is serving corporations and eventually after they leave politics they get some sort of job in relation to these corporations they they care about themselves and they care about their business buddies that's what they care about and these people who have voted for this government thinking that they're somehow going to help them because they they didn't even really express any policies that they were going to do it was it seems like in australia we've gone into this personality politics where you know if you like the look of that person or you like the sound of them or if you, or if you can have a beer with them that kind of nonsense uh if you think you can have a beer with them that that somehow makes them good and bill shorten fell short of that particular personality politics thing i'm not saying he was any good even in policies particularly but you know when it came to i think people are starting to fig- they're not looking at the behaviors of these governments while they're in office and i don't think they truly scrutinize what if they're any better off after these people have been in office for a while i can see this happening again if the labor party doesn't pick somebody who is able to stand up to them and if they don't change their policies and start being the, a real labor which addresses all those issues i just talked about if they don't do that then we're going to continue on getting awful governments like that like the Scott Morrison government they're just going to get worse and worse until it's we just have rulers and we are the plebs the the serfs basically that's what it's going to be just like what is happening in the United States and uh and the greens party are just desperately seem to be just desperately trying to be, be popular and that means sacrificing real things i mean some of the the thing the campaigns that they come up with are just so i think what on earth You know, you, you're not addressing the real issues at all. Even the Labor Party, they were sort of talking about giving us money for roads down here and for boat ramps because we like fishing. Apparently, I mean, I'm vegan. I, I have no interest in fishing, but even if I did, I mean, there there is homelessness in this in Hobart and and around the place. There are people that can't afford to actually live in a in a rented house anymore because rents are so ridiculous. And and there's the list goes on with the sort of problems all over Australia that we're having. and these are the sort of ridiculous patronizing campaigns that people come up with boat ramps and 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 money millions and millions of dollars for roads when people are struggling to survive so i don't know i i just i felt like curling up into a fetal ball last night i almost i felt like i was going to have a, a panic attack i i was so shocked and just to let you know how shocking this was this outcome all the polls you know all of them uh no matter if they were skewed or what all the polls showed that labor was going to was about i think 52 and the coalition was 49 all of them said something like that all of them said something like that and uh, the exit polls uh which are polls that are taken and by the way we have you know a paper ballot system so it's pretty hard to mess mess with a paper ballot system but i still want to know how the exit polls actually demonstrated that uh labor was going to win 
I don't understand how that could possibly be. So the fact that general polls had all said that Labor was probably going to win and the exit polls were all suggesting Labor was going to win and it was so the opposite to that. In fact, the Liberals actually sort of kind of swept in. It was a bit of a bloodbath, basically. It wasn't even close. I think Labor at this point is like 63. Sorry, uh, yeah, 63 and uh, la uh, the coalition is uh, 74. It wasn't even close. So I, I, I would like somebody, if you know of any information of why the, all these polls were wrong and all, and the exit polls were wrong, please leave comments in the comment section because I find that very strange. And if it wasn't for the fact that we have paper ballots and that our electoral system is quite good in that way, it's quite transparent, I would call, be calling electoral fraud at this point with, with how, how badly the polls were wrong and how badly the exit polls were wrong. Uh, so anyway, um, so that Adani mine, I think in Queensland, that really um, people making a stupid decision and thinking that that is going to somehow fix things for them, make make their lives better, and and just sacrificing the whole climate crisis, um, you know, for for the short term uh, short term possible benefits, which probably won't be that beneficial. And it'll certainly create heaps of pollution up in Queensland and generally because of all the coal and the dirty coal or whatever, it's going to be a real problem. It's the largest coal mine, I think, in the world. So it's going to be a real problem for everybody in the world. So I'm really, really disappointed that people chose that sort of ridiculous selfishness. I mean, imminent extinction is coming. Imminent extinction is on the horizon. And this is what we're doing. This is how we're responding to it by saying, oh, jobs, jobs, jobs. I mean, you, this is all you hear in this country. And you see, that's what I mean by, you know, and this is the other problem. They also, just before, the other problem is that a lot of us in Australia are economically illiterate. And you've heard me talk about modern monetary theory, and no, it's not a theory. It's not something that needs to be implemented. It's just something that is a sovereign economy. It's how, it's a description, simply a description of how the operational reality of a sovereign economy works. And, and the, um, that I heard Scott Morrison, and no, none of these politicians use the sovereign economy as they should. But I heard these, um, I heard Scott Morrison last night just before they signed off saying, and we'll bring the budget into a surplus. Well, you know what that means? If you know anything about a sovereign economy, what that means, and the government, by the way, a government budget is not the same as a household budget. And that's what every, um, they keep putting out there that the, so the government budget is the same as a household budget, which is a just straight out lie. It's an economically illiterate lie. And we've been told that over and over and over again, that the government budget is like a household budget. And the problem with saying things like, oh, I'm going to, we're going to bring it into a surplus. What that means is it's going to be cutting social programs for people. It's going to be causing greater social inequality and taking money away from the public. And that's, that's what's going to end up. It's going to end up that we'll be worse off and there's going to be more social inequality and more people homeless and so forth. That's what that means when a government says we're going to bring the, the budget into a surplus. So, um, that to me, when you understand this, when you have a, some sort of understanding of a sovereign economy, that, that just makes me feel very, very stressed. Um, and uh, this is what they keep, this economically illiterate nonsense they keep putting out to the public. And also the other economically illiterate nonsense they keep putting out is that ta federal taxes fund spending and that you have to tax the rich to be able to afford these different programs or that you have to tax people to be able to afford these different programs. That's absolutely an economic lie that they keep putting out there and that's why I invite you to learn MMT look up look it up I'm going to I'll leave some links you can look at stephaniekelton.com and uh, go to real progressives on Facebook R E A L P R O G R E S S I V on Facebook um, and they talk about that regularly and people need to understand that because we are being led into this lie I mean, it's important, of course, to tax the rich for ethical reasons, but tax, taxes do not do what people think they do. Of course, we need to tax, we need to have taxes for reasons other than what we usually think they are, and they have nothing to do, federal taxes have nothing to do with funding anything. So that's why we need to understand that, so we can say to politicians that say that, you're, you're lying. We don't need to tax anybody federally to be able to afford free health care, free public education, and so forth. And the same goes with any sovereign economy. So that's why we need to understand that. So we can say, you are lying, and then tell them why they're lying, and say, now, go ahead and do what you can do. Because we have a currency-issuing economy, 
and the only constraints are resources. And if you're worried about inflation, you can find that out if you look into this further. But that's the other thing that's really problematic and that the Australian Labor Party also feed into that nonsense, and so do the Greens. And I invite you to, to follow Bill Mitchell, Professor Bill Mitchell from the Centre for, um, what is it, e- Unemployment and Equity, I think it is, the Centre for Equity and Unemployment, uh, Coffee, C-O-F-F-E-E. Um, I'm like, I'm, I think I've got that title wrong, but Professor Bill Mitchell has been talking about modern monetary theory for a long time, and we need to understand that here in Australia. Okay, so anyway, um, so that's the sort of things that I feel like uh, I feel like the Labor Party has contributed to uh, the arrival of this s- second time. Uh, well, we've had the coalition now for many for two. Or th- this will be the third, I think, um, the third uh, term for the coalition, uh, these neoconservatives. And it just gets worse and worse. And I feel like because the Australian Labor Party just won't, um, they won't look at and criticise their own direction. They don't seem to be able to internally sort of look for real reasons. They want to blame the Murdoch press. And, of course, they they are to blame, of course, greatly in some ways. But but their own policies in the Australian Labor Party are neoliberal policies and they're not really for the people. They're trying to do this ridiculous tightrope or, or having one foot in both camps and the other camp, the corporations, win. You can't, you have to sort of hold, you have to be able to serve the people and that's not what they're doing. They're not doing that. You know, Paul Keating helped um, the Murdoch press consolidate their stranglehold on the information that we get. Now we just, it's just propaganda. You should read the papers, of course. They, they're like this every day, but you should read the papers today. Um, read online news sources today. It's just dre- dreadful propaganda. And they make out as if anything, if Labor ever talk, talks about something that is for the people, like improving health care, they make out like it's some foreign sort of weird thing that is is really something to be frightened of. I mean, this is how insane it is. Anything that is actually for the public, the Murdoch press vilify and try and distort and frighten people. I mean, it's insane that anybody would buy this, this sort of nonsense. They actually, people have, in Australia, a lot of people, the ones that voted for this coalition government, have voted against their, ultimately against their own interests, except for the ones who benefit from corporations, um, benefit from businesses, or they benefit in some ways from those neoconservative policies. You know, and um, there are a number of people, there are um, rich people in Australia and they do benefit. But there are a lot of people who are, there's also racists and Islamophobes and they've also um, voted just because, because they love it when governments are, you know, crushing minority groups and, and, and vilifying Muslims and so forth. You know, there's a certain amount of racism in Australia, there really is, and in, in, in Queensland there certainly is. If you're voting for the the coalition or the One Nation or whatever, then you don't really you obviously don't give a toss about these um, minority groups. But then, Labor isn't winning any awards for for that either. They, they kind of they say all the right things, but they're sort of I don't know. I mean, they're better in some ways at that than than the Liberal government. But they're not better. Their asylum seeker policies are racist. They're awful. These detention centers on Nauru and Manus that have killed people because they're so abusive. They're psychologically, psychological and physical torture. And this is how we treat people who are fleeing the, the Western imperialist wars that we are causing in their countries. We leave them to rot indefinitely in these awful detention centers and people harm themselves and the children are like zombies, you know, because they're, they're so traumatized and there's abuse and all sorts of things there of children. And this is, you know, this is the Labor Party endorsing those racist asylum seeker policies because they can't stand up for them. They're trying to appease right wingers so that they can bring in more votes. I mean, see, this is the problem. When you try and you go to the center, when you move to the center, you end up sort of basically making yourself just a wishy washy version of the right wingers. Anyhow, I think that's all I was um, going to say about that. Oh, and one more thing, you know, this is the other problem with the Australian Labor Party is that they endorse Juan Guaido, who is a self-appointed military coup 
um, person, who, you know, who the United States, it's a, he, they, he is a U.S. puppet, and he tried to do a military coup in Venezuela. He's part of the opposition there who wants the U.S. to come in, has actually invited them in to do a military invasion of Venezuela, um, but has actually been, you know, sort of set up there and funded by the U.S., to do a military coup, so they've tried to crush Venezuela with crippling U.S. economic sanctions, and 40,000 Venezuelans are now dead due to crippling U.S. sanctions from 2017. And Juan Guaido has actually been inviting the U.K. to impose more economic sanctions on Venezuela. So that's how much he cares about Venezuelans in his own country. There's a class struggle going on there, the Bolivarian Revolution and the, the lighter-skinned Venezuelans who are business owners and, and whatever, they're sort of wealthy and they want the U.S. to come in so that everything can be privatized and they can profit. They don't want the darker-skinned people in Venezuela to get anything. It, they want another sort of a feudal system within Venezuela. So that's why they've been um, trying, tr constantly trying to destabilize the government. They didn't participate in the last election and yet then had the, had the nerve to call it un- um, corrupt elections, even though six million plus Venezuelans voted for President Maduro, and it was overseen by the uh, the Carter group, who said it was they were the most transparent elections, the best in the world. They've been backpedaling the Carter group. That's because they've been pressure has been put on them by the U.S. government, but that's what that's what they said at the time of these elections. And the um, opposition, the the Juan Guaido, who hardly anybody knows wasn't participating in that. Refu they, the opposition refused to participate in that, and that's what happened. So that's their own fault. And they dare to say then that it's not it's not a fair election, please. Anyway, so Juan Guaido is basically fine with the 40,000 Venezuelans that have died now since 2017 from the U.S. economic sanctions, and the U.S. keeps applying more and more sanctions. So, there, so the Australian Labor Party is essentially endorsing and um, a g genocide of Venezuelans. And the other thing they, that there is another disgusting aspect of the Australian Labor Party, apart from the fact that they seem to support everything that the US Empire asks them to do. It's like, you know, they ask how high do you want us to jump? So that's how they are. And on top of that, Julian Assange has been abandoned by both the uh, Coalition and the Labor Party. And uh, he's likely to end up in, in the U.S. Uh, with 45 years of solitary confi confinement and torture and possibly even be executed. And the Australian Labor Party has done nothing. In fact, I've done a video just recently of what Tam Tanya Pl Plibersek retweeted by Neera Tandon, who is a neo-conservative, a neo really. She's not really a liberal, um, but she pretends she is. Um, she's Center of American Pro Center of American Progress. I oh, know here's Rooney's trying to jump up my back. Um, uh, she, uh, she, you know, she endorsed something that was really awful, basically ca uh, calling everybody who supported Julian Assange a cultist. Now, the, the thing about Julian Assange is his only crime in quotes is that he, uh, was doing journalism and the Australian Labor Party can't seem to understand that, uh, that this is a, a press freedom issue and that if he gets extradited to the United States that that sets an awful precedent for the rest of the world. They can't seem to recognize that or w are willfully ignorant of that. So that's another strike against them, as far as I'm concerned, just abandoning that man to this cruel empire. And the U.S. in Bel uh, sorry, the U.K. Belmarsh prison is a, a dreadful prison. And Pamela Anderson, the actor, said, you know, he needs to be gotten out of there or he's going to basically die in there. I could go on about that, but I've done a few videos on that, so please check them out. Um, so, you know, those, those sort of things, just groveling along and submitting to U.S. empire over and over again, and all the awful things that the U.S. Empire is doing, and also just abandoning Julian Assange and supporting a genocide in Venezuela, all these things. And also, um, I'm sure they'll probably be participating in selling arms to, Yem um, to Saudi Arabia, who is conducting a genocide in Yemen. That's also going on. And Christopher Pine from the coalition was selling arms to Saudi Arabia, knowing probably full well what they're doing in Yemen. Now, one child is, has been dying every 10 minutes of uh, disease and famine for the last three years. In, in Yemen, there's been about, I think, 68,000 or something uh, children have died of disease and famine since this uh, this Saudi genocide that's been happening in Yemen, which you, ba you barely hear about in the mainstream media. This is the problem with having a mainstream media that is owned by Murdoch 
or owned by six corporations in the world, you don't hear about this sort of thing. They don't tell you about this intentionally. Anyway, for anybody who's an Australian citizen and wants to find some independent journalism, please check out The Empire Files or The Grey Zone Project or The Real News Network. Um, what else is there? Um, Moderate Rebels. I'll leave um, some links that you can check out. Because we need to get, and we need to be educated about this so that we can actually act on it. Anyway, that's my take on this whole, um, election. And I feel like the Labour Party is probably going to pick another person who is just, um, a, a, a neoliberal as their leader. And they probably will still be wishy-washy. And I can see that the coalition is going to win again. You know, if they don't become a real alternative and actually have some brave positions that they used to have, when Gough Whitlam was in office, then we're, we're just going to keep on getting more of the same. This awful, awful, Islamophobic, racist, minority-crushing, gutless, U.S. empire-serving, corporation-serving government that we have right now. And I really fear for the country in the direction it's going. And Australia is unrecognisable to me at this point. It's absolutely unrecognisable. Anyway... And there are no jobs on a dead planet. So all those people who voted because they wanted a Dani coal mine, um, uh, you're going to get a rude shock in the not-too-distant future. Uh, within probably 2050, it's going to be a disaster for us all, possibly even actual extinction in the next 30 or 40 years. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button if you like the content and please click the notifications bell, otherwise you don't receive updates. Please click the like button if you like the content and do check out some of my playlists. I have a vegan playlist. Um, it gets longer and longer and it's got lots of information on it. And if you are not vegan, please consider going vegan and check out howtogovegan.org. That's my comprehensive vegan podcast. If you're watching Faint Signals from Vega, till next, my name is Trish Roberts. Till next time, bye for now.